Um, hello, this is Dr. Gonzalez Mendez. I'm the chair of the Latino Health Forum. And um, I'm welcome, uh, welcome you <clears throat> to the uh, 28th Latino Health Forum. This time uh, we're doing it through Zoom uh, electronically because um, the pandemic that is affecting us. Um, and we hope uh, next year it will be different. Um, just uh, we talk a little bit about uh, co covering your face is so important. Um, because I'm by myself, I can remove my mask. But um, uh, remember, uh, regardless of what some people are saying, uh, this is the best um, way to protect yourself and protect others. Um, so yes, wash your hands, uh, all the things that you've been listening, but the mask is important. And um, there are many uh, kinds. I prefer this, that this uh, I can wash and and change the filter because with these other ones that are uh, disposable, we are filling the, the planet of plastic. Um, so <clears throat> um, the Latino Health Forum was started uh, 29 years ago by residents of the uh, Family Medicine Residency here in Santa Rosa and the faculty. And since then, we've been doing it every year um, with the idea of reaching our community and trying to share um, what we see as, as uh, problems in public health and determinants of health. This year, uh, and we decided that in October, September last year, we decided to talk about discrimination and health. And gosh, who, we never knew that this year we will be seen so clearly, so obviously that uh, people of color are suffering a lot more uh, than, than, um, than whites. Um, and well, today we have a, a champion that we really appreciate she's helping us, uh, Dr. Kitamura, that, Diane Kitamura, that is, uh, uh, when, I, when I read her bio, I really became uh, emotional because she is a witness and a victim of direct victim of uh, discrimination because the way she looks and, and uh, uh, her family and, and her name. Okay, uh, Dr. Kitamura has served as a superintendent of uh, Santa Rosa City Schools uh, District since February 2016. She has worked in public health for 37 years. So her life dedicated to teaching that I appreciate deeply. Superintendent Kitamura made a decision to become a teacher to ensure all children have access to quality education and an opportunity to learn and grow into purposefully and thoughtfully individuals. She was raised uh, on a Bracero camp and inspired by her undocumented immigrant grandparents. Bracero, as you know, was a, a program and means brazo, arm, uh, and these people really, really work hard and suffer. So their grandparents uh, traveled to United States uh, trying to ensure that uh, doctor, uh, their children have a better life. Dr. Kitamura's mother was intern interned with her parents and four siblings during the World War II at the Amache in intern camp uh, for Japanese American citizens. If you don't know, uh, you really are out of <laughs> touch. But this was horrible. All Japanese uh, Americans were uh, in camps like if they were uh, Nazis, and uh, so um, it was it was terrible. Um, so um, after being uh, released from Amachi, the name of the camp, her mother endured prejudice, abuse, and isolation when she re-entered public school. This was a major influence on Diane's, Diane's uh, the decision to become a public educator. Diane is committed to serving students and their families by ensuring that quality education, educational experience that are provided uh, uh, equitably for all the students. She believes sense making learning experiences and support systems that embrace our students' assets and cultural wealth, engage, inspires, empowers then to dream, be, dream big, find purpose, and thrive. 
Um, guys, we can keep saying things about Dr. Kitamura, but uh, we better ask her to be so kind and start with her presentation. Thank, thank you very much for helping us, Dr. Kitamura. Thank you so much, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, I very much appreciate being asked uh, to present today. Actually, um, I feel honored that a community uh, such as yours would be welcoming me and asking me to present today. Um, you know, when I was asked uh, about this and, and wanting to talk and asked to talk about the disparities uh, as it relates to uh, COVID-19 and beyond, it's, it's difficult. I, I can't help but think about not only the disparities that have occurred as a result of COVID-19, but what has gone on um, in the past and really since I got here in 2013-14. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both. I'm going to be going, you know, talking about the present, what's happening with um, COVID-19 and the other crises that have happened in Santa Rosa City Schools in Sonoma County. Um, and then also talking a little bit about um, data that is on a broader spectrum, a broader scale, um, and then try to tie it all up together to uh, talk about what, it, what can we do. So uh, just as I would be teaching, I would also want us to um, have some of like a call to action or a, um, ideas about how we um, put into action the ideas that I'm here to uh, bring forward and talk with you about. And hopefully uh, you'll have questions and, and that we can um, talk about and discuss as well. So. Let's get started. <clears throat> so um, again, this is, uh, I thought I was being pretty tricky here, incorporating the uh, Latino Health Forum as well as the iconic backpack, you know, for school or the mochila, right? So um, this, this one has to be fully decked out. And I think it's really a metaphor for me too, this backpack, this mochila, because some backpacks are fully filled and some backpacks, well, some kids don't even have a backpack. And so down to the basics of just that idea alone um, spurs on the, the talk that we're going to have today, the discussion, the, the question and answers. So, so remember that yellow backpack and how full is that backpack? Is there even a backpack as we talk about our students? Um, a little bit about Santa Rosa City Schools. So we have just shy of 16,000 students. Uh, we have 24 schools, elementary, middle, and high schools. We are actually an elementary district and a high school district, two separate districts, but under one umbrella or one governance team. We employ 16, 1,600 people. We're one of the top five employers in the um, county. Our free and reduced meals, um, we is at about 51%. So that means 51% of our students get some sort of free or reduced meal. We are 55% Latinx and English learners comprise about 20% of our population. There, uh, Spanish is the most primary language. However, there are about 45 different languages spoken in Santa Rosa City Schools. So here's a little bit I wanted to share about prior to COVID-19, um, because not only is there an impact from COVID-19, but I want us to go back to October of 2017. There's also impact back to the Tubbs fires where we um, closed school for 15 days. There, are, there was the campfire and the smoke that came into uh, the Bay Area where we closed schools for two days. And then we had the PG&E power shutoffs and that closed school for four days. And then we had the Kincaid fires, which closed school for five days. So you can see prior to, prior to COVID, we were already in this um, number of days, numerous days where kids were missing school. And here's COVID-19. Our students have missed 50 days of school as a result of COVID-19. Now, 
yes, we were open, but we were really providing emergency remote schooling. That's this number one uh, in March, as of March 26th. So if we add tubs fire, smoke from the campfire, the PG&E power shutoffs and the Kincaid fire along with COVID-19, students have missed 76 days of in-person school since October of 2017. That is 14% of the number of days they could have been in school, have, they have not been in school. So think about that in terms of students who are already at risk or marginalized in addition, missing another 14% of their school time or 76 days, really in a span of about two years. It's a lot of lost learning time. And I think that is one of the things that's so concerning to me as we begin school back in distance learning this August 17th. Um, I mean, there's no replacement for in-person with your teacher. Uh, we're working hard to, to provide access in ways different than the spring. Um, but how do we make up the other 76 days as we begin having to teach what we need to teach for right now? So these are all the things that we're tackling um, as we work to open schools August 17th in a distance learning format. We have to think about academic supports, um, physical health checks. So in school, when kids are in school, they, they get checks. We have health techs, we have school nurses. There is vision screenings, dental screening, mental health screenings. If, a, if kids aren't in school, first of all, how do we see that there's those needs? Um, number two, how are they going to receive those services? Those are all grave concerns for us in the school district. And today's uh, presentation is really to open this up to the community to say, hey, what are we going to do if kids can't access this at school? Where are they going to access? the checks, the, the screenings, and then the follow-up services. Um, meals, you know, you're gonna see in a later slide the number of meals that we've provided and the food insecurity. I think you have a presentation tomorrow about food insecurity and what's going on. Our English learners and special education students, our most vulnerable population, one of our most vulnerable populations. Services for students, um, English learners and special education, need to be far beyond what is normally provided. Um, and so our, our question, our challenge, our opportunity is, how do we provide those services? And then amongst all of this, all of the Tubbs fire, the Kincaid and now COVID, what we're experiencing is families struggling with income, with shelter and overall family health needs. Um, this is quite concerning. Since the Tubbs fire, Santa Rosa City Schools has lost about 500 students as we, since the Tubbs fire. So going into COVID, we're not quite sure yet um, what students are going to show up, in, even though distance learning, because of these, these uh, challenges that families are facing, where they may have to go live with other families, or they may have to leave the area because it's less expensive to live. So that is a, the students not in school is a community, um, challenge in that if students aren't in school, that means parents aren't here. What does that do to the economic structure of Sonoma County, right? So it's all intertwined. If there anything, if there's any message that I can uh, continue to share, that is the, the interconnectedness of schools with the entire community, with the work community. Um, it's very critical. And so I think having you have me here today uh, is a great idea because I want to share about that, that we're interconnected. We cannot do this alone. What you see here, it really has to be all of us together um, providing these supports, these wraparounds for uh, our students. So let's talk a little bit about the data. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive in. I'm gonna talk about some elementary school data and then I'm gonna talk about some secondary or high school data. With the elementary schools, I'm gonna talk about attendance data. Um, chronic absenteeism. 
That is if a student misses 10% of the school year, 10% of the school year. And so uh, that would equate to 18 days of school. What I want you to look at are the differences. If you see the yellow arrows and the green arrow, and this is where we begin to see disparities. There's disparities throughout the system, but I wanted to give you some hard fact, fast data that can, you can just look at and see. And if you look at Santa Rosa City Schools and take Highway 101 right down the middle, you have what we call in the district, the east side and the west side, okay? So Abraham Lincoln and um, Brook Hill, you see Brook Hill at 19.4% um, are in town and to the west. And so that is also predominantly where our Latin, Latinx, Latino communities reside. Um, so if you looked at population. So the numbers are high. The chronic absenteeism, the, um, the state average is 12.4%. So you can see with Abraham Lincoln, Biella, Brook Hill, we are well beyond that 12%, okay? But let's take a look at Hidden Valley. Hidden Valley would be a school considered on the east. They have an 11.79% chronic absenteeism rate. Okay, so compare east side 11.79, city and west side 19 to 15% chronic absenteeism. What's going on there? That's the question that we begin to ask what's happening. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. The other one, the other medical absences. So of this chronic absenteeism, of, of that uh, portion of being absent, I also interestingly found that 4.9% are due to a medical reason, okay? Let's compare that then to Hidden Valley again. The medical reasons are 2.6%. What is the difference? What is causing this difference? What, what gaps are there and how do we fill those gaps, okay? Here is the green arrow demonstrates an anomaly. James Monroe Elementary, is more on the west side. But look at 7.92 chronic absenteeism, 2.3% medical absences. So the question is, and the discovery for us as a district, what is James Monroe Elementary doing, the staff, the principal, so that chronic absenteeism is much lower as well as the medical absences? So th those are the things that this data then helps us to lay, take a look at what are the best practices happening at James Monroe Elementary. So that's number one. Number two, what support services are we not providing for Abraham Lincoln or Brook Hill Elementary? You know, what's happening in there? Is it parent education? You know, is it enough screening, medical and health screenings? So um, the data doesn't answer questions, the data raises more questions for us, which is a good thing um, in order to eliminate this disparity that you could see, you can see. Let's go to the next slide. Now we're gonna look at um, secondary. This is the latest data we have from 2018-19. And some of the same attendance issues carry on up through high school. Those that are most have most chronic absenteeism are also gonna be most likely not to graduate. Um, and I go back to, let me go back to this slide that I forgot to say when I, I, that I pulled up my notes. On this chronic absenteeism, one of the top five issues creating absences due to medical issues and just chronic absenteeism in, chronic absenteeism in general are uh, asthma, and dental health, asthma and dental health. So again, if we look at those, one of the top five indicator, one of the top five uh, health issues affecting, then for us as a district, we're gonna focus on, do we have enough dental screenings, number one, and the um, asthma, checking to see how many of our children have been identified with asthma, and do they have the inhaler at school? Do they have the proper medical care? So. Um, again, I forgot to say that before, so I wanted to come back and address that fact, especially because I think there's a lot of medical providers, 
dental providers in the audience, I hope, that can um, work together with us on, on these various types of supports that we can provide to close that disparity and, and most important, reduce all of these chronic as absenteeism numbers. Um, the, the likelihood of chronic absenteeism in kindergarten and first grade at these levels will mean at third grade, students will not be on grade level. And once you're not at grade level in reading at the third grade, it becomes a greater challenge that leads to more dropouts later on. And so um, I don't know if any of your other speakers or any speakers ahead of me or, or after me are gonna talk about you know, preventing students from the, um, preventing students from dropping out. Well, really it can begin in kindergarten and first grade here. And the, and the statistics and data show that, that, that simply around health to reduce chronic absenteeism reduces dropout rate. Okay, back to this. Four-year cohort graduation rates. I think the numbers can demonstrate that Latino students, 78.3% compared to white students at 85, compared to all students at 81. Disparity right there. In terms of the county, we are lower than the county overall. And then let's take a look at compared to the state. In the state, 82.1% of Latino students graduate um, in comparison to all students at 84.5%. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as I move through the slides. Let's also look at overall graduation rates by high schools. Now, some of you are saying, oh my gosh, or some people would say, why would you ever show that data? Because it is what it is, right? If you're going to fix problems, you're going to change the way things are, you got to address what the problems are, and you got to be upfront about it. Okay, here, I'm getting kind of excited now, so I mean, let me slow down. <laughs> my translator is probably <laughs> cursing at me right now. Tell me if I need to slow down. But Again, I want you to see Piner High School. Piner High School is on the west side. And look at their numbers in the last year, 2018-19. So what's Piner High School doing, right? With, it, with a uh, Latino population that is well over 50%. You know, their graduation rates are chugging along, moving right up, okay? The thing that you have to remember too is that on my next slide, as a part of a policy change, we have implemented uh, A through G as a graduation requirement this last year. So we're going to see some ups and downs in our graduation um, results, I think. Maybe not. I hope not. But I think the reality of is, is a new policy change could make, have some changes in graduation requirements. But even with that change, we have to take the risk to change our graduation requirements because look at our A through G university entrance percentages. Um, so this means uh, these are the students who, the percentage of students who completed A through G requirements to apply to the university or state college. SRCS in 2017, 15.8%. No bueno. I can't, I can't deal. And so um, our board and um, our teachers and our administrators, um, we've come together and have made these changes so that the requirements are the default curriculum. It's the default classes. Um, because when I entered into Santa Rosa High School, Santa Rosa City Schools, um, we basically had a tracking system for kids. Um, and kids were tracked into different areas. And if you looked at the data, of those tracks, whether it was, you know, vocational or, um, you know, whatever it was, um, the high percentage of uh, students in courses not headed to college were Latino. So, and you can see in comparison, you know, how can we be at 15.8 and the state is at 39.4, right? Not acceptable. Absolutely not acceptable. So Jose Ferreira has this quote, data adds concrete information to a teacher's, and insert whoever you are, whatever your position is, observations and intuition, but it will never replace experience, 
personal relationship, and cultural understanding. So all of the data that I just showed you um, is important and it is concrete information. But as a standalone of just data, I don't know that we can make the changes institutionally that we need to make in order to close the gaps, to close the disparities. And so please remember this, this, this quote um, as I continue to move forward into the information that I'm providing. So here's the question. How can we change social and economic structures that perpetuate the patterns of disparity in the data and our communities? That is the question. It can be asked in many different ways, but that is the question. And I would say that it's really wrapped around disrupting the structures, okay? Disrupting the structures. So what does that mean to disrupt structures? Well, first and foremost, I'm gonna tell you, it doesn't mean it has to be demeaning. So if you look on the side, I wrote disrupting doesn't have to be demeaning, okay? In other words, um, I, I feel that in my position as superintendent, and I came into the district as an assistant superintendent in 2013-14, I think you maybe can tell by my personality, I'm kind of nice, you know? I'm not, I, I'm, I'm kind of nice. But don't be fooled by my kindness because of my actual strength to disrupt. And I'm gonna talk and show you a little bit more about that. And when I say I, I also want you all to know it isn't about just me. There is a whole group of people um, that I have built authentic relationships with in the school district and outside of the school district to do the work that we're doing. Um, it, it, it is so important, especially in times of crisis, that you have the ability to call on people in your local community, in your workplace, but also outside. Um, I think some of the ways in which we've been able to really move through the district move through these crises and support families and do the things we need to do is because of the relationships that I have been able to forge with people all over the county and especially of the other policymakers. Um, I think that's another piece of this puzzle is that um, in order for us to do collective advocacy, which is the next item, and, and really elicit policy change, um, it's gonna take a group. It's, it, it, it's not just me alone. Uh, I can be the catalyst, but I need to look from both on both sides for the people beside me to help make these changes. And so um, authentic relationships, you could also call it networking. Um, I, you know, there's other terms for it. Uh, I think along with authentic relationships is communication uh, that is transparent, that is honest. Sometimes um, it's hard. What needs to be said is hard and it's, and you don't want to hurt feelings, but you know, if we aren't in that place of authenticity, I don't think we can address the real issues at hand and get to the root causes of what is actually happening and causing the, the issues to occur. Um, and collective advocacy is really just like teamwork and collaboration and coming together um, and doing things uh, with like-minded people and bringing along people who are not like-minded. And, and what's your strategy around that, right? Um, yeah, uh, I had a board member, uh, I like this saying, um, keep, the, keep the elephant's nose under the tent. So keep the elephant's nose under the tent. So even the people who may push against you, uh, find out why, listen, and, and, and really hear what's going on there. Um, because I think there's answers in those, those people. I think there are answers when there are people disagreeing with you. There's something there. All of that to say this to really disrupt structures, to really make the changes that need to be made. And this is from an organizational standpoint, um, takes policy change. It takes changes in the policy because that is your infrastructure. So when I'm gone and retired, the policy stands, therefore the social justice and the support 
all is still in place in Santa Rosa City Schools for our students. Um, so just, just think about how are you making the changes, not just on the surface, surface, but deep, deep down into the roots, into the structures of the organization. And all through that, and probably one of the first things that has to be addressed is where is your organization, where is your group of people around culture? And I don't accept, in personally, cultural proficiency or pro, pro, cultural competency. I, I, I even would say not even cultural consciousness, uh, cultural responsiveness, because that means you're responding to something. I wholeheartedly believe in cultural consciousness. It is interwoven into every cell of my being. Um, every, you know, I think, I dream, everything has like a, a, almost like um, multiple tentacles because I'm thinking of every person it, it could impact, every culture it could impact, every, um, you know, some simple things like that people can do to speak up, uh, things that are said around the, the you know, coffee bar or things that are jokes that are made. You know, those are some really, people kind of say, oh, come on, we're so over that. No, I still hear people say things that are so inappropriate, so microaggressive. Um, and folks, we have to speak up. It, it has to be second nature. It can't be something, oh, let me think about that. What should I do? What should I say? Consciousness means it just comes out of every pore of you and that you, it, it's said, it's done, it's acted upon. Finally, I struggled on this last one because really what I'm talking about here is the courage to risk. It is the ability to um, almost take yourself out of it, out of the picture to what is best for, in my case, our students, almost at, no, at whatever it takes. <laughs> Now, uh, granted, I'm later in my career, you know, some people think, well, you're later in your career, you, 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 you know, you can say those things, you can do those things, you're older, people will respect what you're saying, nah, no, no, that's not true, nah, no, 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 look, look, right, I get people that, like, they take a beeline away from me in the grocery store because I'm Asian, right, I might be Chinese, I might be, you know, the one that brought the virus over, I, I get it, right, I get it. Um, and it's not, is it right? Absolutely not. Um, but, um, my point in saying that is you, I, I'm going to say, I'm not you. I have dug deep all my educational career to take a stand on behalf of kids who have been underserved. And that goes against the status quo in many, in many places, in many ways. And so if you want to do this work about closing gaps, reducing the disparities, then you have to be courageous. You have to not give a damn about what people think of you and you just have to do it. I know cliche, but it's true. It's true. So let me do some nitty gritty now. Like, okay, I talked about data. I talked about some frames and principles around disrupting. Here are some nitty gritty actions that you just have to do because it's the right thing to do. Not every kid in our district has a device at home. So in the spring, we handed out 4,400 Chromebooks and 1,300 hotspots because that was the right thing to do in order for all of our kids to be connected. And this fall, we're doing one-to-one, -one, 16,000 students, one-to-one -one devices that will go home and hotspots or access to internet. What would, cause sometimes it can't be a hotspot, but whatever it is to get them access to internet. I wanna say here that, you know, last spring was emergency remote learning and it was inconsistent. And I know it wasn't the best for all kids and families. Um, we mailed over 5,000 packets home, um, big like pallets, pallets of packets. It was what we had to do. It was the right thing to do so that all kids had access. And I'm talking little kids, um, our little ones. And we provided school supplies as well. 
uh, but we recognized that it was inconsistent and it was difficult for students and difficult for parents. And we have worked hard over the summer to revamp how we will do distance learning uh, starting August 17th. Connecting with students. It was extremely important to us, to me, that we accounted for every single 16,000 student in the district when we went on remote emergency learning in the spring. Together with our staff, and I mean our staff, our teachers, our administrators, and most importantly, our family engagement facilitators who are bilingual. Uh, every school has a family engagement facilitator. Um, they are one of the most valuable employees um, that I, I could ever have. Uh, we contacted all, made contact and, and made sure all but 97 students uh, were contacted. Uh, phenomenal out of 16,000 students. With those 97, we sent registered letters home. Um, of those 97, there 69 of those students were Latino. And so those posed some question to us. What, what's going on? What was happening? Why, why the disparity again between Latino and non-Latino students? Once we sent the registered letters home, we got it down to 10 students. And what we found, <clears throat> those 10 students had actually moved out of the area. Um, and so we were really, we were really, really um, made it a priority to ensure that all students were connected to the school. The, 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 the Latino students who did not, uh, were not um, connecting prior to uh, the register letter, um, many of them, it was changed phone numbers or no phone, um, various reasons that could be, we could help them to support them so that they could connect. Um, so it was, in, it was really important us to find out what, a, what was going on with those 97 students. Um, yeah, I, I think that I'm, I'm really pleased with what we did to make this a priority. And I think that's another thing that you will have to address and work with and deal with is uh, people will say, well, we can't afford to do all of these things. Granted, but where are your priorities? So of your resources, where are you prioritizing the most resources? And this is where equity and equal come into play. I know we hear this a lot, um, but equitable resources are providing resources for where they're needed most. Um, and where it was needed most in this case was to make sure that every single student had connection to school. I said I'd talk about meals. Since March 26th, San Rosa City Sch Schools provided 620,000 meals. And I will tell you, I went out to the, to the distribution sometimes, and uh, we did not turn away students from other school districts. Uh, we really, there was no ID, I did, no IDs were shown. Um, if parents came, but they couldn't bring their kids, we gave them the meals anyway. The rules were you had, the kid had to be there in order to give out the meals. I just told staff, feed families, just feed them. We'll worry about how we, pay for all this later um, because it's a priority. It's a priority. We partnered with Redwood uh, Empire Food Bank to have uh, the food pantries at all of our uh, food distributions. Right now, we're continuing to feed families um, up until August 14th. Uh, what we do need to do is, is, and I've been asking and everywhere I go, is please encourage families to fill out the meal applications because after August 14th, the federal government has saying we cannot just give meals out. There will be no reimbursement unless there is identification and the student is there to receive it. So it's receive the meals. And so we do not want to turn away any kids. Um, I will find other ways in which to feed kids if that is the case, but for the sake of families, please spread the word, fill out the app meal application. It's on our website and I have my website, our website at the end of the presentation. Another action that we took was our integrated wellness center. And so we received funds from Kaiser, Comcast, and North Bay Fire Relief. We have our own integrated wellness center at 
where the old Lewis Adult Education School is on Lomitas. We have a warm line that's available so we can provide uh, appointments. It's free. This is a free service. Um, in addition, we'll do, we'll do times where we'll do vaccine, um, flu shots, we'll do uh, screenings, we'll do other things as well. Um, and so, and we love volunteers to come in and help, especially on the medical side. Um, and so this was another action that we felt was extremely important. And we'd love to replicate this, uh, not just at Lewis, but at various locations throughout the district. Here's a little bit more about the cultural consciousness piece. Um, we, how, do, how did we do this? How did we get there? I, I'm a firm believer that you have to shift, nudge, disrupt, shake up mindset. And the one of the reason, one of the ways in which I have uh, worked on this over my 37, 38 years is training. So we sent to Los Angeles 700 staff to the Museum of Tolerance. And every year we still send 40 to 50 staff each year um, just so we can keep the training going. We have 450 staff trained in unconscious bias. Uh, currently, we are working with Dr. Curtis Acosta um, out of Phoenix, um, out of Arizona. He is, the, um, he is behind the movie Precious Knowledge and the Arizona Movement for Ethnic Studies. Uh, so we're, we are working with him on culturally responsive, sustaining and humanizing pedagogy or called CRUSH. Um, and what, we're, what he is working with us as training teachers uh, as we roll out our ethnic studies um, curriculum. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in policy. We've also had the good fortune of working together and partnering with Kinkanza Nuri Robbins, Stephanie Graham Revis, the National Equi Equity Project and Ed Trust West. So this, this has been a real effort, a real push in the first few years I was here is to actually get some, a group, a movement, a momentum, a tipping of the scale of people trained in becoming culturally conscious. So I don't normally have a lot of writing on my PowerPoints, but policies to me are so important because it's the long lasting institutionalized change that we all must seek in our separate organizations that I did it anyway. So, uh, but I won't read it verbatim, I promise. But here, here's what you need to know. When I came in in 2013-14, there were some things that were happening in this district based on a policy level that I could not believe was happening. I, I, I was floored. And so one of them was this, you had to choose between a CTA, CTE pathway or vocational pathway and a university pathway. So in my book, because I'm a former CTE teacher, those two things aren't separate. They can be combined together. You can go take CTE classes and go to college. You can, I mean, there's, there's no need to separate. But what was happening is special education and Latino students were shifted to CTE, while other students were shifted to um, college prep. Segregation. Holy cow, 2014, I've come into a district, what is going on? Another thing that I found, students who were suspended, and at this time we had one of the highest suspension rates, primarily Latino, that we were called out by then um, Attorney General Kamala Harris, okay? Uh, we were suspending students for five days. They would also be removed from their extracurricular activity for 25 days, double jeopardy. Imagine students come to school because of sports, because of music, because of all the other things and they, not necessarily for math and science and English and social studies. So that was removed. Okay, this next one, I tell you what, I could not believe it. So students who did not earn the appropriate number of credits to move to the uh, sophomore, junior, senior. So let's say they earned uh, so freshman credits. They stayed at, they were labeled a freshman forever until they moved up credits. So you could be an 18 year old freshman uh, because you hadn't earned the credits in your school. And imagine the, how demeaning that was. Imagine what kids felt like um, because they didn't move along with their class. And 
predominantly those who didn't move forward were students of color, okay? This was also, I hate to say this, but I'm gonna say it. This was a way for the district to keep students from taking the California high school exit exam because you needed to be a 10th grader. But it prevented that from happening so that our, not mine, that, that back at that time, the high school exit exam results looked much better because only certain students were taking the high school exit exam. Gone, that was that, psh, gone. Uh, if you received an F for missing 20 or more days, you automatically got that F. That's illegal. You can't do that. So that was removed. Um, then we talked, we did, uh, we approved standards. Whoops, sorry. We did standards. Whoops. Uh, Common Core standards. Um, we went to the A through G. This was huge. The A through G graduation requirement, uh, like I talked about before. We amended the intradistrict, this seems silly, but we amended the intradistrict policy to keep school kids in their neighborhood schools. So preventing them to, from going from west to east, stay in your neighborhood schools so we could build up those schools. We adopted an English learner master plan, um, hugely important since we have 20% of our students English learners. But we also had a, approved an advanced learner plan that was more equitable uh, for students of color and students in general. To encourage board members to run for board, the board uh, waived the $1,200 approximate um, cost to run, to run for board members. Now, sorry, that was my timer. I didn't mean that for that to go off. Um, we, just as uh, President Trump was elected and gonna be inaugurated, it was very important for uh, us to bring forward a resolution to become a safe haven district before he took office. We did a, we moved from at general elections to seven trustee areas. And if you seen, if you can see our board now, which I think probably many of you have, it is one of the most diver, div, diverse elected bodies in Sonoma County. And I would say uh, in California. You know, these are just some little things that mean a lot. The ability to wear tribal traditional regalia at graduation, the ability to not be color specific on graduation gowns. Um, they seem little, but they're huge to kids. They're huge to families. Um, we created a new strategic plan. And as I said earlier, we have ethnic studies as a curriculum approved by the board. I'm so excited about that. And yes, you see that K-12 um, and on top of that, the board approved uh, ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. So this is a span of 2014 to 2020. As I said earlier about policy has to be the center of structural change. Um, and I wanted to show proof of what we have done in Santa Rosa City Schools. Uh, finally, uh, what I said in there was about our mission and vision. And I tell you, I could not be more fulfilled as a superintendent, as an educator, as a human being, as a Japanese American woman, to have a board of trustees work together with me, along with me, to create this vision and mission statement. And at the bottom left, I have the priority values, priorities, and commitments, and I encourage you to go look on our website and read those because um, it's a model for, I think, any organization uh, in the California, in the United States, in the world to, um, to follow. And um, I, I'm just gonna, I, I don't, I, I wanna read it, I don't wanna read it, but I am gonna read the mission statement and that is, SRCS ensures equitable access to a transformative educational experience grounded in the assets of our students, staff and community. We nurture the whole student in an engaging, challenging and safe environment. We recognize and value each student's individuality and our community's cultural wealth. And with that, I thank you and appreciate you listening to me today. Um, I hope I was able to share with you some uh, information and some strategies and some of the ways in which we have uh, made the changes we've made in Santa Rosa City Schools. This is my information. This is the website where you can go see more information. 
Um, the phone number is my district office phone number. The cell phone number is my cell phone number. And here's my email address. And with that, I turn it back over to the panel. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kitamura, for that amazing and well thought out presentation. Uh, I really liked, you know, hearing a little bit about the data, hearing a little bit about what's going on um, with Santa Rosa City Schools and, you know, our community at large, the specific actions that were taken uh, to mediate a lot of these uh, gaps that were happening with students and their access to learning while switching to, you know, remote um, schools. So thank you so much for, for all that. We will now be opening it up for a uh, question and answer. So for folks who want to ask questions, please go ahead and uh, drop them in the Q&A uh, section at the bottom. And you can also try to uh, use the raise hand option if you want to ask your question uh, live and we can do that as well. If not, if you're a little uh, nervous, we can uh, ask it for you in the Q&A section. Um, so yeah, let me go ahead and start with a few that we um, have gone. So we, let's see. Um, okay, perfect. I'm glad you left it on there because one of the questions was, can we have your contact information again? So yes, if you want to just leave it there, that'll be yeah. great. Um, all right, so we have a question here from Anna uh, saying, I know that reopening of schools across the country is being planned, um, sometimes without a lot of input or collaboration with school nurses. How are school nurses being involved in the planning locally? Um, thank you, Anna, for the, the question. Um, we actually have a return to school plan. It's about 80 pages. Uh, we had over 220 stakeholders with um, about 20 different committees involved, of which one of them was um, health and safety. And we had, I think most of our school nurses was on that committee to provide input. And then it, um, the criteria for health and safety became a part of our actual return to school plan. So it's on our website um, if you'd like to take a look at it. Uh, but uh, the answer really is it's they were very much involved and continue to be involved. Um, I, I can answer our, uh, Mr. Martinez's question about can we somehow reduce yes. the number of school districts in the country, in the county, in order to make meaningful changes easier? Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Although my colleagues are probably watching. Sorry, colleagues, but um, it's very difficult because we have eight, just Santa Rosa City Schools alone, we have eight feeder districts into us. So K-6 schools that come into our school. And um, it, it's difficult. It, the articulation um, is it, difficult to, um, it's difficult. And I think there would be continuity if we could uh, bring together some of the smaller districts with some of the bigger districts. So, yeah. Perfect. Uh, looks like we just, uh, we have another one here from Griselda. Uh, how can Santa Rosa Community Health um, better collaborate with Santa Rosa City Schools to provide warm handoffs and get children or youth to get their health care needs met? I'm guessing uh, Griselda might be someone from Santa Rosa Community Health uh, asking to see how uh, her organization can get involved. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would, what I would love is if we could meet, um, I think we do already have some partnership with Santa Rosa Community Health, but I think if we could come together as a collective of more, more health, um, including dental and eye, um, I, think, I, I think more is better, like screenings more, like once a year screenings isn't enough. And so if we could come together and design um, a preventative, plan uh, for our schools and especially our schools on the west side um, I'd love to be a part we'd love to be a part of that so please email me my, my information is up here and I will connect you with our health our nurses our um, assistant superintendent that's in charge of um, all the health side of things so that we can let's 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 reimagine let's create uh, to close these gaps so perfect uh, we have another um, question, anonymous. Uh, 
will parents get information in their preferred language on how to access, understand, follow uh, long distance learning? Yes, so we've sent out a couple of letters. Uh, if you haven't received a letter, go ahead and email me. I know people think I'm crazy to do this, but it's okay. Uh, just email me and I'll get you connected to be sure you're on the mailing list in your language to get this information. And also tomorrow at five o'clock is a parent meeting in English around distance learning. And at 6.30 is the meeting for Spanish speaking parents. And so please come join either one of those meetings so that you can uh, hear more about how you should select which uh, distance learning model you want to go to and also answer any questions that you might have. Awesome. And it looks like we have somebody uh, yeah. who is going to ask a live question. Oh, Anna, hey. so Anna. So Anna Valdez will be unmuted now. Thought that I could raise my hand and I, I don't want to take up too much time because I've already asked one question. It's okay. Um, but this is more personal. So my granddaughter goes to school in Windsor and she is Latina. And um, one of the challenges we really had in the spring was with having so many different learning platforms. You know, they're, they're using Google Classroom and they're using Weebly and they're using this and I, with a PhD in nursing, could not figure out what work she needed to do. Mm. So I'm wondering if you could speak to what's being done to try to make the online learning very clear and accessible. I, I just figure if I can't, with a PhD, figure out what her homework is, that, you know, younger students are not going to be able to do that. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, and I... I um, the Windsor, new Windsor uh, superintendent is a colleague of mine that I talk with a lot. And so I'll school him a little bit. If you're out there, Jeremy, I'm coming, watch out. Um, so what we've done is we've worked together with our teachers. And um, in particular, that's why this return to school committee was so important because of the stakeholder voice. It was parents, students, teachers, administrators, uh, community people, all coming together and it was hard it was really really hard but this stuff is hard and if you want to be you know have a social justice and equity mindset it's hard and so uh, the piece that came out the biggest was exactly what you're talking about it was what are common platforms that are going to be used across the district what are common standards that are going to be taught across the district um, what can I expect from my teacher? What do I need to expect from myself? What do I need to expect from my students? If you go on our website, that's all in the return to school plan. Um, so in our district, I can't speak for Windsor, but Google platform, Google Suites is the platform that will be used throughout. Uh, essential standards have been picked out for every subject level, every grade level and every subject level. It will be about those essential standards and not trying to teach every standard up for California. Um, there'll be specific assessments based on those essential standards. Um, we're having teachers come together beginning August 10th so they can work on that specifically uh, for three days um, at the start and then they have another one and a half days at their sites. Um, it's not going to be about us standing and delivering PD, it's going to be about them working on their units and their lessons so that they are consistent and understandable to parents. It can't, here's the thing about distance learning. It cannot be teaching like you would teach if you were in person. It has to be a different way because we can't expect parents to teach that. So we have to teach the important concepts or how to access those concepts. So when students go home and do their distance learning, not with a teacher, they're able to do that work. So um, we recognize that we are doing a lot of preparation and training around that. Um, and we are going to collect data uh, around it um, so that we know if we need to adjust and change and move in different directions. So great question. Um, and if you need me to, if you need help, just, just reach out. They're all our kids. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dr. Kitamura. Uh, we have another question. These were pulled from um, our registration. Oh. Uh, and this was similar to the question that was asked a little bit earlier. Um, this person is asking, how are uh, Latinx monolingual families being helped to make sure their children are able to attend school, specifically in regards to um, technical difficulties and the and the mix with uh, language barriers and how they're able to navigate that? Yeah, um, the 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 um, everything our website everything is translatable, so you can click the translation. So that's the kind of the easy answer. Nice. The more difficult question is accessing your family engagement facilitator at your school site who is bilingual. I think that is the key person. Um, so whatever school site you are or you, you, you go to, if you're in Santa Rosa City Schools, call the school and, and get a hold, uh, leave a message in Spanish for the family engagement facilitator. The other way is if you call the desk phone here, 707-890, my new executive assistance is bilingual. And so she can also intake your message and then we can connect you with the help that you need. Uh, and I did have a few other questions here noted down. Um, so this one, this one is actually for me. <laughs> so I, um, as we mentioned to you uh, a little bit before we got started, uh, I work in higher education at Sonoma State and you know, obviously the, the, the things look a little bit different, but there are a lot of parallels with the new transition to remote learning. Um, how are you, um, are, how, has your district been thinking about ways to, you know, evaluate the, the needs of the students while they're remote learning and what that might look like? Because I know at the beginning you mentioned, you know, the devices were given, the hotspots were given, um, but now that things have kind of extended a little bit, have the, have you noticed there's any changes? How does the district plan to evaluate that in any way and how would that look like? Yeah, um, so we're just in the phase of going to one-to-one, -one, so we haven't, we haven't quite done it yet. Mm -hmm. um, the state of California, the legislature, actually in passing Senate Bill 98, which is um, really around educational funding, there are some accountability factors in there that I think will help us measure. Um, one of the new uh, one of the new areas is this. Uh, it's called daily live interaction, and so it is a requirement that there is daily live interaction with students, um, even if they're not, even if they're distance learning, or even if they're in the hybrid. If you're here in school two days, you still need to have that interaction. Um, also around coursework and coursework being turned in. I think those are all ways to measure, first of all, engagement, uh, and then secondarily, how they're doing in the actual coursework. Um, so that'll be our, our mode um, of evaluation. I think that, excuse me, the other is attendance. If, yeah. if kids are showing up is gonna be an indicator. Um, if they aren't showing up, then I'm gonna send that group of people out again to do that intense contact um, which is also data around how kids are doing, what's going on that they are maybe not attending. Um, and and I, I'm especially, um, you know, conscious of families that may, like my own parents, they would not have known who to go to if their student wasn't doing the work or if the computer wasn't working or something. They, you know, they wouldn't necessarily know who they were supposed to talk to at school. So we have to we have to reach out and do that. We we have to go and and find out what's happening if we see a student not connected. So um, both virtually and you know both by computer and by you know just their their um, engagement as a student. So that that's that's going to be our our way of evaluating basically on a daily basis. I'm sure I'll be looking at data every day just to see where kids are, what's going on, are they are they there. Um, so great, great question. Um, mm -hmm. There's a wonderful comment in the um, chat from Itzul Gutierrez um, from the Redwood Food Bank. Uh, thank you for putting this up on here. Um, it's uh, the federal meal, meal waivers to be extended so meals can be distributed without, without a meal app. For meals to continue as they have been this spring and summer, 
if you haven't already, would you join us in speaking up at our, at our representatives and the USDA? So we really need to push hard so that we get these meals for free. Um, so whoever you can advocate to, please do uh, at the federal level. Um, I know we are, we are doing that uh, as well. That it's very worrisome to me that if the federal government does cut off the ability to feed kids without some sort of a, you know, documentation or whatever it is they're going to ask for, um, that's a worry for the community. If you can, you can see we gave out 621,000 meals, you know, what's going to happen? Um, some of those will be covered by free and reduced meal apps. If you look at our data, it's 51%. So what happens to the other 300,000 meals? We, we, we've got to, yeah, got to be on top of that. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, we have, uh, I think we'll uh, go with these two, last two questions. So uh, we have um, Cristina Palacios. How Hi, are Christina students? Cristina Palacios, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> So how so are students who depend on sports for their PE credits going to be helped to achieve their credits to be able to graduate? How are athletic students who were hoping to get scouted or who focused on sports for college university going to be helped? So um, you, if you're in distance learning, distance learning hybrid, well, even if you're in learning house in our district, you're still going to have PE. Um, if, it's, if it's around the sports, uh, sports right now are all moved to the spring. And so we're gonna just pray and hope that sports will be all sports. So even the fall sports have been moved to begin practice on December 14th. So let's wait and see, Christina, how that goes. If the sports aren't being allowed, then we're gonna need to do waivers. So please don't worry about that. We would do a waiver for the PE under the circumstances of the sport not being um, allowed to uh, participate, because, allowed to, be um, done because of the um, pandemic. So don't worry about that. And then, and then the scouting, um, yeah, again, we wait till the spring sports for the scouts to be able to take a look. Here's the thing, everybody's in the same boat. So they can't scout anybody differently than any of you because there's no sports going on in the fall, okay? So, and then also if you have um, tape from previous, um, matches and previous sports uh, get those tapes together from prior to this year if you have them mm -hmm. and then um, there's another one has a school system been in contact with the sonoma county library system regarding the regarding reopening to some extent or to even have extended curbside pickup hours in the evening for working parents i find it confusing that restaurants and wineries are open but access to library materials resources is still incredibly limited. That is a great idea uh, that we will talk about to our library, county library connections. Everybody, every student in our district has a library card. So um, I think that uh, that is an awesome idea about the curbside. Um, I have, I am even exploring because we have school buses and the school bus people are going to kill me, but oh well, uh, that because our school buses aren't being used because we're in distance learning, why don't we pack stuff into the school buses and take them out to neighborhoods? Whether it's supplies, whether it's books, like you're saying, whether you might need help with something, like socially distance inside the bus and help a kid out, like if they need some help. Why not, right? Right? I, I think it's a great idea. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see, uh, uh, yeah. I'm going to push that one a little bit. The buses aren't being used. Santa Rosa City Schools are paying for buses, even though they aren't being used as a part of our, our uh, joint powers committee thing, whatever. So let's put them to use by, I think, doing this library stuff. Yeah. Good. Thank, thank you, Dr. Karamora. And no problem. Uh, I actually do have just one last question, and sure. then we'll close it up. So um, my question was, how... Um, are we kind of mediating the, I, like you said right now, everyone's kind of in the same boat, but I know a lot of folks right now, like this was maybe the year that they're really going in for um, college applications and, and really, you know, getting everything sorted out so they can, you know, start college right, uh, right after their senior year. Uh, how, 
do you see any kind of challenges right now that are, that have arisen in, in terms of preparing uh, some of our high school students for college? Um, I know you mentioned A through G a little bit earlier. So uh, what are those uh, challenges and uh, what do you think could um, be done to mediate that? Yeah, I think we are so fortunate in Santa Rosa City Schools because we have dedicated um, funding for five college and career counselors specific to supporting students uh, in uh, applying to preparing for college. Um, the San Rosa JCs help always with the financial aid nights. Um, we'll, we want to continue those. I think that it is difficult in a virtual format um, to, do, to do some of that. Um, I think if we can socially distance and maybe bring some people in so that um, it's just not as easy to be able to fill out things on a computer. Uh, we're very open to that. We've bought a lot of plexiglass um, and a lot of hand sanitizer and a lot of PPE equipment, and we're willing to use it to provide that support. We don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, of course, but, 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 we're, but we are willing. Um, there are, uh, I, I think our biggest, our biggest um, um, highlight, our biggest, uh, opportunity is really through our college and career counselors who have such good relationships with kids. Um, we will have two new college and career counselors, one at Montgomery High School and one at Santa Rosa High School. Um, the other three college and career, career counselors are still um, at their sites and Ridgeway um, has theirs as well. So actually there's six uh, part-time at Ridgeway High School. So really students, if you're pushing and wanting to get started, um, go through your, um, contact your uh, college and career counselor at your school site. Nice. Yeah. Well, once again, uh, thank you, Dr. Kitamura, for your presentation, uh, for joining us today in part in uh, this seven day series that we're doing for the Latino Health Forum. Um, any other questions that we didn't answer, I will forward to Dr. Kitamura and she will um, hopefully, you know, get back to us as soon as you can with some answers yes, and we'll post it to our website. Yes. Yeah. Um, again, thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors. And then I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gitamura. That was very, very informative. Your idea of uh, sending the uh, school buses is brilliant because our families will trust them and working with different uh, agencies, different groups, uh, we find that is many people don't trust any official, uh, any official, uh, any, nothing that looks official. Um, yeah. But the school is uh, school buses are our family, and um, and that's one of the problems that we are not reaching the community um, during this pandemic. So th that's brilliant. Uh, Dr. Kitamura, I really, really appreciate your, your presentation and, uh, and I want to thank you very much for your, all these years of service and I hope you don't, you don't retire soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, I mean, at least keep working part-time um, because uh, you're so valuable, your experience is so important okay. and your heart is, is in the right place. Thank you very much again. Okay. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I want to uh, invite the, uh, our audience, um, many left uh, because it's time probably, but tomorrow we have an amazing um, uh, presentation uh, that is basically uh, about food um, and how people in this horrible tragedy can have access to food. Uh, it, it is amazing that um, the richest country in the history of human beings. This is what we are in the United States. And there are many people hungry, many. And with this pandemic, then more people are hungry um, on, on one side. On the other side, I read somewhere that, that we waste something like 25% of what we produce, food. 25% is, is millions of thousands of uh, 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 tons of food. I mean, th this is this is this is really incredible and un unacceptable. So tomorrow we have three great speakers: Gillian uh, Haley, uh, Montserrat Archila, and Lillian Merino. 
and um, they are going to help us uh, navigating uh, to help our families uh, how to access food um, because uh, having having people malnourished in United States in California that is the seven six or seven economy in the planet um, we are in a very rich county of the, the one of the richest state of the richest country. I mean, this is incredible. This is surrealistic. So maybe in uh, is because among other things, people don't know uh, what to do and how to access um, the the sources. Uh, but we will help tomorrow with uh, these wonderful speakers. Thank you very much, and uh, take take.